All right, I think we are live. Uh, hello, uh, it, it, it's great to, to be here. Uh, my name is Martin and I'm here with James. Uh, I think one thing which connects to us is that we are both developers of PySol, which is the Python library from, for Spatial Analytics. And we will be uh, trying to walk you through one very small part of, the, of this library today to give you a live demo of how that can be used to analyze the structure of cities and how can we get a, a lot of interesting data from open, op, open data sets using, using this. Uh, I, will be get, uh, I will be walking you through the live uh, notebook, so we will be coding. Uh, I will share my screen because it's probably the right time right at the moment start doing that because we do have materials ready for you. So you don't have to just follow uh, what I'll be showing on the screen. You can open the code yourself and you can run it on, either on your own laptop if you wish so, or uh, online using uh, the my binder session. So if you will open this link and I will ask James to put the link to the chat so you can all, all, all find it and, and just click on it. You will uh, you will find the repository on GitHub which looks roughly like this. And there are some instructions how to follow the Dota tutorial if you wish to follow it live. Uh, you don't have to code along. I will be do, going through the whole code myself and you will see every step how, how it's done and, and what it's doing. And, and you, don't, you don't just have to uh, code yourself and there is not, not, nothing to, to write. The whole code is, is prepared. But if you want to run it just in your browser, you should be able to click the launch binder button, which should open an uh, environment just like, which will look exactly like this one. On your browser running on my binder instance, which is a community driven uh, service for this kind of purposes. Or if you prefer, so if you are familiar with Python mostly, you can also run the whole uh, notebook locally. There are some in in instructions. We do have a, an environment file, so you get the right versions of right packages. Just a small warning uh, if you just want to install libraries into your existing environment, make sure that you are not using the very latest pandas uh, because it has a bug in it, which causes the whole notebook I will be showing to go very, very sideways. And it took me a long time to figure it out. So uh, I, will, I hope that the link is currently in the chat so you, you, you can open that. And uh, as I said, we will be talking about how to understand the structure of cities through the lens of data and just a quick introduction of who we are. Uh, I am Martin Fleischmann. I am currently fellow at the Geographic Data Science Lab at the University of Liverpool. I'm also a postdoc at the Charles University in Prague, where I'm currently based. And I lead uh, uh, data and analytics in a small data startup called Urban Data Lab, which is based in Zurich in Switzerland. And together with me is James, and I will let James to introduce himself. Uh, yeah, I'm James um, Gabwardi. Um, I'm uh, currently an R&D research associate scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And in my, uh, in my free time, I'm also um, a lead developer on the, um, the PySAL project for several sub-modules. And uh, as Martin mentioned earlier, um, that's really what connects us. Um, we work together um, very frequently on, um, on open source software projects. Thank you. Uh, so you have a bit of background of who we are. Uh, you probably already understood that we will be talking uh, about Python during this tutorial. So if you prefer R, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have a version for you right now. I, so I hope you will like Python for, for this kind of purpose as well. And to be fair, I'm not sure if the, for this very specific uh, application, there is a, an R alternative with a similar functionality. But without uh, talking uh, a bit more about introduction, we can go 
through uh, the actual tutorial. What I will do in the beginning is very brief uh, introduction of the topic, and then we will start coding and start loading some data from OpenStreetMap and start looking at them and figuring, figuring out how to make sense out of that. Uh, that was a mistake. So. The reason why we're talking about this is that it really matters how we arrange stuff and in, in cities. And by stuff, we mostly mean buildings, we mean streets, and, 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 and the general special layout of how, how we build our cities. Uh, this image from uh, New York Times from the, I believe, Microsoft Building Footprints uh, really illustrate very well of, of what we are be talking about and the differences between, between places like this. And uh, it's, it's very up-to-date topic because uh, it matters a lot and not only in academic literature, but it's becoming quite more prominent in either local or, or, or national or even international planning documents. The, the form of, of, of cities is becoming more and more in the, in the, in the forefront of, of, of these discussions. It's not yet where we would like to have it as urban morphologies, which is, which is my academic background, but we're getting, I believe, in, in, in the right direction. I hope so. And we were talking about urban form. We were talking about, as I, as I said, about all the built stuff, uh, all, all the, the ways how, how we form our cities. So we can essentially uh, ask about the questions, what does it look like? Uh, when you're talking about cities. We're not talking about function, we're not talking about people at this moment, we're not talking about flows or, or, or points of interest or things like that. We're talking about the, the physical aspect of, of, of city, so physical structure and appearance of cities. So uh, when we talk about urban morphology, which is the field uh, of study focusing on urban form, uh, we essentially talk about a couple of fundamental uh, elements of urban form and uh, the, the literature kind of focuses on three of them those are buildings uh, as a 3d objects those are streets uh, mostly represented as, as networks or, or graphs mathematically and about plots which are pieces of land which usually form a contiguous contiguous grid or, or mesh of, of of polygons in in, in the data sense but we should also talk about open spaces a bit. That's one thing which tends to be omitted from, from urban morphology in, in some cases as something which is like uh, inherently there when we talk about building series and plots, but in some cases that, that's also uh, one thing we should, we should focus on. So these are the elements we'll be working with, we will be, we'll be, we'll be looking at during the, this tutorial. Uh, the main question of, of, of this session is how can we describe it? How can we, we describe your compositions and how can we capture that in numbers? Because this is special data science symposium. So you're going to try to look at buildings, streets, plots, and try to transform them in, in numbers, which we can work with later on. Uh, here, a very useful uh, field is called urban morphometrics. So as you, as you can probably guess from, from the name, it's a field that measures uh, morphology. So we are going to uh, quantify the, the urban form, quantify all, the, all these aspects and their relationships. So it's all about, about measuring. Uh, we can measure several things. Obviously, you can imagine that yourself, but those can be roughly uh, categorized into six different uh, groups. We can measure dimensions, uh, which is the easy thing. What is the area of building footprint? What is the length of street from intersection to intersection and things like this. We can measure shapes. Is the building square? Is it more circle or is it very, very complex, uh, like a castle shape? Things like this, uh, whether the street is, is exactly linear, linear if, 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 if it's a straight line, if it's very curvy, like cool de Saki, all these things. Uh, we can measure spatial distribution. Uh, at that point, we are starting to look beyond the single element. So we're looking at how far are buildings from each other, 
what is the relationship between street and a building? Are they aligned? Are they not aligned? How far are they from each other? We can talk about intensities, uh, and those are like the typical urban densities. You can measure the covered area ratio, how big portion of our city is actually covered by buildings, how big volume is, is on a certain area, or we can also measure what is the density of intersections at a certain place. Uh, we can measure connectivity that mostly relates to street networks uh, and, and day properties like centralities and, and, and other aspects, but not only that. We can also to a degree measure connectivity between between plots and between blocks, depending on their contiguity and, and, and these properties. And we will see a bit of that later on. And the final class is diversity. So we can measure how all these things essentially vary in, in space. Uh, are all buildings along the same street segments uh, oriented in the same way? Are they, are, there, are they from the same distance from the street? Uh, are all buildings uh, of the same size? Do they have same shapes in certain areas? And we can try to look in, in, into the into this distributions of all these values. So those are the six categories. Uh, we will, I think, try to cover all during this presentation, but I'm not entirely sure about that. So why are we doing that? Why are we talking about this? specifically now. Uh, the, the main reason is that it's not been a long time uh, since uh, we uh, actually can do this. Uh, when I started my PhD a couple years ago, uh, there was not a, a lot on all the morphometrics. There wasn't a lot of tools. Uh, even the data were a bit scarce. But with the rise of open data and all these things, we essentially finally can. So we do have plenty of really nice data on urban form, be it uh, OpenStreetMap, we all know and we will use today, or be it some open data portals from uh, local governments or local municipalities. Uh, we can get really beautiful data sets uh, encoding individual buildings or individual building composites like blocks or all the streets. It, ver it varies, obviously, from country to country, from place to place, but we have plethora of data to work with. And we have tools. And that's where we, uh, as, as, as software developers, myself and James and a wide group of other people uh, within this community come in. Uh, and uh, in Python, we have roughly three tools are practically two in the end, uh, which we've been first involved in, in in development of, and second, which are useful for this kind of uh, urban morphometric analysis. And those are GPandas, PySAL, and MomPy, which is currently part of PySAL. It wasn't at the, in the very beginning, but right now it's federated within the PySAL family. So very quickly, what is GPandas? It's an open source project uh, which adds support for geographic data to pandas object. Pandas objects are bringing data frames and all the features you may want from, from data frame library to, to, to Python. GeoPandas is essentially enhancing that and adding the, the geo uh, aspect to, to data frames. So you can think about it as a, as a GIS in, in, in Python. If you are familiar with R, SF is essentially the alternative of, of GeoPandas in our world. Uh, PySAL is slightly more specific. It's not like a general purpose GIS tool. It stands for Python Spatial Analysis Library. And it's a federation of, I want to say, 21 individual packages, uh, each focusing on different aspects of spatial analysis from our interpolation, uh, spatial regression, and uh, spatial optimization, and, 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 and much more than that. Uh, and one of these aspects, uh, which are currently embedded in Python, in, in PySAL, is urban morphology. And that's a module called MomPy, which is urban morphology measuring toolkit. And that's a library we'll be more, mostly working with uh, today because they're specifically designed for morphometric analysis of urban form. 
And at near the end of the presentation, we will finally start coding. Uh, just a quick outline of what we will try to do. Uh, we will start with nothing. We have no data in the repository, uh, but we will try to get some from OpenStreetMap. Uh, uh, we will get uh, street networks and building footprints. We will try to generate some other data. Uh, one of them will be the tessellation. I will show you later what that is uh, because OpenStreetMap doesn't have plots and we would like to have something like plots so tessellation can substitute plot for certain types of analysis. Then we will measure something we call morphometric characters. Those are essentially variables we can measure uh, based on these input data. Uh, and we will measure the primary the characters. Those are those capturing dimensions, shapes, distribution, connectivities, intensities, as I mentioned before. And then we will turn them into something we call contextual characters that describe how the spatial distribution of each of them uh, looks within the surrounding of every single building. And we will try to use this kind of information to get urban types from a map of, of, of a town. So we will try to understand uh, which part of the town is historical core, which is the modernist area, and and and, and this is and, and these types of, of, of development, like the, the patterns. And that's the end of my presentation. So I hope that by now every every one of you who wanted to uh, run the code along uh, is looking at the notebook. If not, and you won't still want to do that, there, you still have a bit of time. Uh, keep in mind that if you are doing it in the my binder way, in some cases, it, it may take a while to actually build the, the image to run the container, but we tried it before the presentation. It should be fine right now. So a bit of agenda of what we'll be coding, uh, a bit of input data, cleaning, figuring out what actually comes from OpenStreetMap and how can we turn it into something we can use. Uh, generating the morphological elements and combining them together. Then we will be doing the actual measuring of the, of, of the, info, the, of the fun stuff. Uh, and then we'll try to understand context and get the, get the urban types. So I will start with, with a couple of cells. This is just to get us some information. It's mostly useful for, for later when we open the notebook in, in a year or, or someone else to make sure that uh, they use roughly the same versions as, as we did in case something goes wrong. And I'm going to import all the libraries we need. Uh, the important ones, as I mentioned, will be GeoPandas, which is the geometry engine powering all of it. It's going to be a libpycel, which is a component of PyCell, which that is uh, covering the fundamental elements we need for any spatial analysis in Python, like spatial weight matrices, and I, I, I will talk about it later. We have MomPy, which is the dedicated library for urban morphometrics. And we will also need OSMNX, which is an amazing library written by Jeff Boeing. Uh, which allows us to download data from OSM uh, as GeoPandas GeoData frames, so we can directly start and work with those. So all seems to be loaded correctly in correct versions, so I think that nothing stops us to start looking at some actual data. Uh, this code should work on most or places, if, if, if they have a decent coverage in OpenStreetMap. Uh, we will be using a town or city called San Galen in, in Switzerland, which uh, has nice historical core and then some development around it. And then we have Time Otero, which is the amazing start of, of the presentation. Yes, good. So San Galen is a town in, in a valley in, in Switzerland. And you can see that in here, it has the historical uh, probably medieval core. And there are some different parts of development around it, uh, some, some industrial zones on the sides. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a decent size, which allows us to, to run this fairly quickly because as the size of the, of the town or city grows, 
uh, it tends to tends to be some some steps tend to be a bit more demanding computationally. So you can change the place in your own notebook if you want to try it on, on something you know. I would suggest to focus on something smaller and something with reasonably varied morphology because uh, in the end, this is just an illustration. It's not the actual scientific method to, de to detect urban types, which this is based on, but it's using just a very small fraction of that. So in some cases that where the morphology is not extremely like well specified, it may not be that amazing as, as we would like it to. So I would suggest go with San Galen and we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Just to quickly what I did here is that I have specified the San Galen as, as place in Switzerland. Uh, I can skip this for, for a second. And I have used GeoPandas geocoding tool just to give me a point where Sangalan is to, to show you an address on, on, on an uh, interactive, interactive map. I'm also specifying local projection, which is the, this is the Swiss national projection EPSG 2056, because it's much better to use the local national projection rather than some local UTM zone, because the, the precision will be much higher. Uh, everything needs to be projected to, to meters and to, 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 it, we cannot work with, with lot long coordinates. So now we know the place, we can start getting some data. So we will use SMNX to uh, first get the building geometries from a place. So the place is defined up here is the Sangalan. It will, so OSMNX or the, the API will do the geocoding automatically and it will give us every polygon in, in or every object of geometry in OSM, which belongs to this place, which has a tag uh, called building equal to true or anything. So we can run it. If you are running it for the first time, it will probably not be that quick as it is in my in my case because it, it's cached already. So it will take about half a minute, forty seconds, something like that. And this is the the, the data frame we, we got back. So we have the type of element. So we have some nodes which are points, which is really weird for buildings. We have ways which are polygons. Uh, you have all OpenStreetMap ID and all the data that can be potentially filled in OpenStreetMap. You see that as, as, it, as it used to be with OpenStreetMap, the completeness of, of, of these tags is fairly uneven. So we will actually be dropping most of this. But we have downloaded how many? Nearly 10,000 10, buildings. And we have 189 columns, which we will probably not want need. Regarding the geometry types, most of them are polygons, as we would expect. Uh, there are four points. So what I'm going to do right here is just to drop the points and keeping just the polygons. We're making a mask uh, saying, give me everything that is a polygon. And you can, you can drop the points. And our resulting data set looks like this. So you can see that every single building in here is nicely drawn as in the building. There don't seem to be any overlaps between the buildings. And the uh, map seems to be fairly nicely complete, which makes us happy because this says that we can happily proceed with the uh, with the analysis. In some cases, what may happen is that, uh, for example, center of the city is looking like this. And then in other areas of city, this block is drawn as a single polygon. Uh, try to make sure that you don't run into this situation because it means that you are measuring different elements at different places of the, of the city. It's causing quite a lot of troubles in, in interpretation of what actually is, is being measured. It, it, it happens with OpenStreetMap quite frequently because the consistency of the map, especially when it comes to building footprints, is not great. But there are places like San Galen in Switzerland where this is not an issue. And finally, as I said, we will keep only one column, which is the geometry, because 
we don't essentially care within this tutorial about, about anything else, all the other tags. And we will project it to the local CRS, local projection we have specified before. And one thing that is super helpful uh, and quite mandatory for some, 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 some features of MonPy is the unique identifier of each polygon. So this is the data frame we are starting with. So we have cleaned something which came from OpenStreetMap, we projected it and assigned unique identifier to every single building. So this is our starting point when it comes to, to geometry of, of building footprints. We will also need street networks. We can luckily get the same uh, from OpenStreetMap as well using, again, OpenSMNX. Uh, in terms of uh, buildings, which are polygons, points, it's for some reason, but mostly polygons, we can get directly geometries, which means that we directly get GeoPandas GeoData frame, which is this object. In terms of street networks, we first uh, need to get the network of Sangala as the graph. Uh, it does have uh, some geometries attached to that, but generally it's a, it's a graph like a mathematical mathematical construct. Uh, we can project the graph again to the local projection, as we've seen before, and from the graph, we can finally create the geodata frame. The reason why we don't work with graph uh, from this point uh, directly is that quite a lot of stuff, uh, MonPy and Morphometrics in general is working with is geometry-based. So we essentially... Uh, for the first steps, then we may turn it back into graph for some connectivity analysis and then turn it back to, to link everything together. So again, we do have the data frame of um, street network right now coming from OpenStreetMap. You can see that, again, it has quite a lot of uh, information assigned. We have the origin uh, destination nodes or OSMID, some information about one ways and, and, and uh, the hierarchy of streets. But most importantly, we have the geometry of each, every single of them. If you want to just look at it quickly on a map, this is how the, the network looks like. So yeah, it's, it's, we have just downloaded just the driving network. So, so there are some missing links that may potentially cause some trouble, but it's good enough for, for, for the sake of this, this presentation. We can also get the walking network, but that tends to have some other issues that all, all, all these parts will be, will be probably included. So it's always a, a trade-off between, between the, the dif different uh, details. Um, if I were doing it for a research paper, I would try to get all these streets uh, drawn on the map because those are the real streets. doesn't really matter if I can drive on them or not. But morphologically, those are streets, but I wouldn't want these paths there. So in this case, we are going with the driving network, which is the closest to what we would want. But there are some limitations within this, this tutorial. We also need to do some pre-processing in here. Because uh, what may happen is that we do have a node, like uh, a split between the, of the line in different places in the intersection, but we want geometries to represent the network as it would be a graph. So we want a one line string starting at one intersection and ending at, at, at other one. There shouldn't be any, any break in, in, in between. Uh, there are probably some that's usually the case for OpenStreetMap, so we can check how many we have right now. We are starting on 3,529 uh, geometries, and if we use the MonPy's uh, function to remove these false nodes, which are in the middle, uh, which essentially merges the two together, uh, we can also assign the network ID. We will probably have a bit less. Yes, so we can see that we have lost uh, about 90 rows, 90 geometries, because they were merged together to make sure that the topology of the street network actually reflects uh, the, the, the relationship between different street segments. So we do have the, the data. 
and we can start doing the morphologic stuff finally. What we don't have uh, are plots. So we need to find some, some surrogate. We need to find something which will serve as a plot, serve as a spatial unit, serve as the, the entity delineating the space around buildings. But since we don't want to go to cadastro and, and, and things like this, and OpenStreetMap doesn't have anything we could use, we can create morphologic tessellation. What is that? Very weird term. Given the building footprint like this, we can generate morphology tessellation, which looks something like this. I, 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 will, I will tell what, what I did. Um, we take the building footprint as an input for Voronoi tessellation. But you can see that this Voronoi tessellation is based on polygons. So we essentially discretize the outline of, the, of each building into a set of points. Uh, I think that the default distance between the points is half a meter. We can go below that, higher than that, but half a meter seems to be the, the optimal, optimal value for this. And we create a diagram, which is then back dissolved into polygons coming from individual bullet buildings. And this is, in practice, an area of, of land which is closest to each of these building polygons. That's, that's what it is. There is some limit, because otherwise it would go to, to infinity. Uh, so I have loaded this, these, these, these buildings and, and this tessellation already from from Mumpy because this is built in, but since we don't have this built in for Sangalan, we need to create it. So we will create the limit, saying don't go beyond certain certain polygon, certain area, and we use something we call buffered limit. It's just 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 the utility which buffers all buildings by a certain distance. In this case, it's hundred meters and dissolves the whole area. So we know that the morphology tessellation cells don't go beyond 100 meters from each, each polygon. And there are some other ways how to make tessellation a bit more precise, how to link it to, how to limit it by street network and things like this. But this is the, the kind of most default default option of, of generating something that can serve as a, as a plot for certain types of data analysis it doesn't replace plot fully, obviously. So you can see that we have done a couple of steps automatically in, in, by creating the selection. The first was in world offset. The buildings get shrunk a bit to make sure that there are gaps when the buildings touch. So we have space where to do the, the edge of the, of the tessellation. We created a Voronoi diagram and they solved it into final polygons, exactly what I mentioned. We do have a one warning coming in here. They said that the Talix tessellation contains multi-polygon elements. Uh, that's not really what we kind of look for. Uh, generally, uh, as, as a result of incorrect building geometry, that's something uh, kind of breaks in in, 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 the, in the process or when there is, for example, like one wall, very tiny wall, uh, in, in, in some cases that, that may cause the problems. We can look into those and, and, and fix them if you want to, but it's just four, five of them. I think it's, it's, it's okay in this case. Uh, we want to link uh, buildings and streets because Every building sits on, on certain street. We can use the built-in GeoPandas function, which is called spatial join nearest. So we get the nearest uh, street segment for, for each building, which for buildings give us a new column, which is called network ID and an ID that is assigned to every, every street. I can quickly, I did a mistake. We can quickly check this. Hey, Martin. Yes. We're coming up at, um, we have about 25 uh, minutes left. Um, just I'm aware of that. that. Okay. I'm aware of that. I'm not happy about it, but I'm aware of that. <laughs> so so we did now, now we have a link between buildings and streets. 
we do have some duplications probably because two streets were at the right exactly the same distance from buildings so we can just quickly clean it and we can merge the same information to tessellation so we have link between tessellation and street network as well using the nid parameter so that's it all elements are, are are ready for to be measured when you talk about dimensions i mentioned that those are mostly areas and lengths and easy, easy things like this and for this we actually don't need uh, anything in, in mumpy if you're talking about these straightforward so in this example we will measure uh, area of building footprint area of tessellation cell and we will measure the length of street all those are built-in functions in GeoPanda, so essentially any other GIS software you can you can find them. Uh, but then we can start measuring shape, and <clears throat> here we have a couple of diff different things. We will measure uh, something called equivalent rectangular index of building. It's um, index measuring the shape complexity by comparing it to the rectangular of the same area. We can measure elongation of buildings, whether the building is more like a square with the same sides uh, that's, uh, or if it's more elongated, like a long rectangle. Uh, we can measure convexity of tessellation uh, that measures whether the tessellation cell resembles a convex hole of, that of, of its own on, on polygon, whether it's more concave or how, how much is the difference between the two. Uh, we can measure linearity of street segment that measures uh, the difference between the Euclidean distance between the first and last point and the actual distance when you go around around the street segment. And uh, we can have a quick look at the maps, how it looks like. We can see that we are specifying some symbology which we'll be using throughout the, the notebook. In, in, as, as variables, so we can just just reuse them and don't have to specify it every time. Uh, so what we have, have we measured here? The first one is the equivalent rectangular index on the left side. Uh, you can see that <coughs> the lower the, the the value is, the the higher the complexity of a building is. On the right side, we have the elongation. Uh, Below that, we do have convexity of uh, the tessellation cells, and we have linearity. So we can see, we can see that these loops have very low linearity, while everything which is nearly straight or equally straight has has very high linearity. So this is this is the principle of of, of shape characters. Um, keep in mind this this image just 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 because we will come back to it later because it doesn't show very significant pattern in it at the moment, but it will, it will become useful later on. Regarding spatial distribution, one good example is shared walls ratio that measures how big portion of outer wall of each building is shared with another building. So how closely packed they are, they are together. Uh, in, in case of Sangalan, uh, the historical core, which obviously tends to be one building right next to each other, is kind of popping up from, from, from the map and everything else, which is mostly isolated, self-standing buildings, is having shared walls ratio of zero because there is no shared wall with anything around. <clears throat> but until now, with the exception of the shared walls, we were talking about individual polygons, individual features, and there was not a lot of relation between the two. Shared walls was a bit of intersection between them, but we may want to go further. We may want to understand uh, which tessellation cells are neighboring with which, and we may, we may, we may want to encode it in a certain object. For that, uh, PISA will help us, and we can generate something called queen contiguity which on the example from above looks something like this. So the red are the edges of our tessellation cells. And if one tessellation cell uh, shares at least a node, at least a one single point with any other, they are marked as neighboring. And we can get this kind of graph uh, reflecting the contiguity of the mesh of tessellation cells. And this is very useful because we can then use it 
to measure some other morphometric characters. So I will quickly do it for Sangalan using oscillation. And then we can look at uh, what we can measure. So for example, number of neighbors. So this one have quite a lot of neighbors around, while this one, be it on corner, has only three. And this is this may be interest, interesting information because it, it distinguishes from very ordered, rigid uh, structure uh, compared to some organic one. We can measure the covered area within the neighbors. So we can measure kind of how, uh, how big of an area the object and its neighbors, immediate neighbors, actually cover. That is an interesting to, to, to know for granularity of a space. Uh, or we can measure the distance to neighbors, neighboring buildings. So we can use the uh, gr spatial weights metrics, which is created based on tessellation. But since, the, since there is one-to-one -one relationship between tessellation and buildings, we can directly apply the, this weights metrics to buildings themselves, and we can measure the uh, mean distance to neighboring buildings based on the contiguity of their underlying tessellation cells. And the results look something like this. So we can see the covered area. We can try. To, we can. We can. We can see that the more darker ones are more granular. So the object and its neighbors tend to cover the smaller area than something which is more towards the sides of of the, of the town. Uh, the similar stuff happens in neighbor distance. We see that very dark colors are in the in the city center, and we probably have something very very far away in here, which is skewing the it's it, it's skewing the color map. But we can try. It. We can see some some green colors popping up here and there, which means that the buildings tend to be a bit further away from each other. We can also go a bit higher uh, than, than immediate neighbors. We can use this weights metrics, which is called queen one in this case, and generate another one which encodes uh, all the neighbors within three topological steps. That means that if I start here, I can jump here, which is one topological step. That's my immediate neighbor. I can jump here, which is the second topological step, which is the neighbor of the neighbor. And I can jump here, which is the third one, which is neighbor of a neighbor of a neighbor. And I can, I can consider all these within the same neighborhood and then, look, and then ask uh, for other questions, like what is the mean interbuilding distance within this neighborhood? So not only my building and its neighbors, but kind of uh, taking all that into account at once or we can look into a building adjacency, which means that if I have a neighborhood composed of 100 tessellation cells, do they form 100 composites of objects? So when I when I when I mean what I mean by composite is uh, if I have several buildings that are touching each other, they form a single composite. So do I do I have hundred of these composites? Which means that every single buildings sits by its own, or do I have four of them, which means that there are very large packed blocks. And the, the spatial wise uh, matrices of higher order will help us directly with these questions, uh, which on map is not even shown here, but I think we have jumped quite a bit in here, um, which is quite good for time, actually. Uh, we can also create spatial weights matrices based on building footprints, which is useful for again other questions. Yeah, we do have the we do have the figure for the what we measured above in here, and we are showing this in here because for building adjacency we have used not only the higher uh, contiguity uh, based on the tessellation, but we have also used this contiguity based on the building footprints. So we essentially compare the components of those two graphs within the neighborhood. And these are the results. So we see that everything that's in the center tends to join much more than the peripheries of, of, of the town. 
We can also measure street profile as a relationship between street and building. Uh, that gives us uh, estimation of street width, the deviation of street width, and openness of street, which means whether there are buildings all along or whether there are just few buildings and a lot of gaps in, 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 in between. I will not go through that just to make sure we are run, uh, we don't run out of time. Regarding intensities, we can measure covered error ratio. As I mentioned, that the simple rate ratio between the area of tessellation cell and the area of a building which lies on it. Again, more denser seem to be the, the central parts of, of Sangalan. When, we, when it comes to con the connectivity, we usually need to turn the geometry of street networks into a graph, into a network, actually. Uh, in MomPy, we use Network X, Network X library to manage uh, the network calculations, so we can get a graph and if it will tell me, yeah, and and and, and create a Network X class and, uh, compared to the data frame we had before, and we can measure a couple of things. We measure node degree, which means how many other street segments come to each node. We can measure closeness, centrality, and measuredness, which are both like local connectivity measures. And then we can take the resulting graph and turn it back to geodata frame of nodes and geodata frame of streets, because all these are measured on, on the nodes in reality. So we can quickly plot them. Uh, feel free to dump questions on these to, to chat and James will answer them while I'll, 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 I'll rush through the rest of the notebook. Uh, in order to uh, link the results from nodes to our tessellation cells, which we treat as, as our buildings, which we treat as, in the, in, as the basic elements within this work, we can use MomPy function, which gets the node ID and links it to the, to the building. And it's not just the nearest join, but it ensures that the node actually lies on a street which is uh, already identified as the nearest. So we cannot just have node on a different street but then it's nearest just to make sure that we have consistency in there. And right now we do have the selection on which we have measured a couple of things, but we have some information measured on buildings, something on streets, something on nodes. So we can all of it merge to the selection based on the network ID and node ID we have defined before. And buildings are merged on the unique, unique ID because the unique ID of building is then passed onto, onto the selection. And we have all our columns we may be interested in for further analysis on a single data frame. So you can see that we have all of it in here including some, some, some stuff which may be useful for other types of analysis, but it's not an actual morphometric value. With that, we can try to understand context. So why well, I will start this because it take a bit. Uh, we take every single of morphometric value we have just measured. Uh, we take the contiguity uh, metrics, denoting the three topological steps, and we try to measure the that we try to reflect in some way the distribution of these values for each of the morphometric values within the neighborhood of each building. And we do it with a function called percentiles. So what we get is the first, uh, second, and third quartile of the distribution of values within, within each neighborhood. So we see that for area of tessellation cell, we now have three columns. This is the first quartile within the, the neighborhood of the first tessellation cell. This is the second, and this is the third one. And we have exactly the same thing for all the variables we have measured until now, which gives us quite a decent number of variables, which is 60. Just quickly to plot it and to show the difference between the original measure and the contextualized one. This is the convexity we've seen above, and I mentioned that you should remember it. it does, there is not a lot of pattern, but if we look into the spatial distribution of it within certain context, with some spatial lag, which we try to capture with, the, with, the, with these percentiles, we see that there are some pockets of higher values compared to other pockets to lower values. So it, this can be actually useful in detection of types. 
Uh, we detect types with very simple thing, k-means clustering. For that, it's much better to standardize the values, obviously. So we do that. We don't have to worry uh, about uh, outliers a lot in this case because we are truncating the actual distribution quite significantly since we are using uh, the the quartiles anyway. Uh, to do the actual clustering and to understand how many classes we need, we will use a small tool which is called Clustergram. It's another library I've been I've ported a couple years ago from R actually to Python, and Clustergram uh, takes the data. I'm filling just to be sure, filling some NAs. There shouldn't be any in the in the, in, the, in this case, but just to be sure. And we test everything, every clustering option from one. It doesn't really make sense, but it's nice for visualization up until 12. We do just 10 initializations for uh, and the illustration. And clustergram shows us the behavior of clustering within these different options uh, and how different features kind of split or, or rejoin as, as we uh, go with the number of classes. And we can then look at it and understand, okay, at which point we assume that the clustering is stable enough where some major chunks get split and then became stable. So from this clustergram, I would say it's it's, it's going to be eight clusters, the, the optimal number. If you want to be very conservative, we can say four, but let's go with eight. I, I recommend looking up clustergram if you want to understand more how, how, the, how this works don't have fortunately have a lot of time for that right now so uh let's go with eight and you have to trust me that this is the this is the right choice clustergram gives us the labels for every single of these options so we can directly use it assign it to our uh, to our data i'm assigning it to back to the data frame which has the geometries and then uh I want the new data frame, which call, which uh, consists of geometry of buildings and the value of cluster. So at this moment, I have a data frame, which looks like this. We recall that we've seen something very similar and above, but right now we have a new column, the most interesting one, which is called cluster, and it's containing the ID of individual clusters. And now how that looks like on a map is this. So we do have our town of Sangalan divided into eight different classes. We call zero until seven. And we do have some indications that in this area there is one type and in other area there is other type. So as we would expect, the historical historical core is being delineated as one cluster. Something which probably is more dense around this around this center is another cluster, and then we can go further and further and further away, and we see that there are some uh, classes which tend to have more industrial nature, something which is a bit less orthodox, something which is fairly uh, fairly simple single individual villas. Uh, something which is mostly somewhere in the countryside. So given that we have used just a small sample of 20 morphometric uh, categories and very straightforward way of contextualizing that and just k-means algorithm, I would say this is quite quite useful result. And we can further dig into that. We can further unpack uh, what are the uh, differences between them. We can use all the values and uh, interpret them so we can assign names and we can assign values to every single of the of these types and work with it further and further and further. So that's all from the notebook. I actually managed to finish five minutes before the time. So I will now ask James if there are some questions in the, in the chat. Uh, I should uh, answer why we have the notebook uh, on open or whether I can close the we can stop sharing. Um, there have been no questions on the uh, morphometrics um, stuff. The only um, thing that came up, and this was actually probably the most successful live coding demo um, that I've ever been a part of, um, because the only um, the only issues that came up were the in installation of um, 
of watermark and clustergram. Um, and so it was a, yeah, very, very okay. successful. So, <laughs> so, so, so let, let me stop sharing. Feel free to dump any questions to each either chat or, or Q&A. We'd be happy to answer those. Uh, if you are interested in, in, in more, you can uh, find some links on the notebook on the very bottom of it. There's a list of references we've been working with. And this uh, method is based on a couple of papers I've been publishing in past years. So you can even find those and look at how uh, that can be expanded into something a bit more robust. I see a question, how much work did it take to translate Grastogram from R to Python? Uh, the initial translation wasn't taking a long time. I think it was one evening. Uh, I was then doing some other work on top of that, like the interactive plotting and, 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 and some expansions. So we can now use Clustergram, whether we are doing clustering on either CPU with scikit-learn or, or SciPy or on GPU with Rapid. So there's been some, some ongoing work on that. But the origin to rest translation was was fairly quick. It was it was very very very, very straightforward thing to do. Okay. I, yeah, I guess there are no other questions. I'll give you one more minute. Uh, if you are interested in morphometrics in R, there are some packages which are doing bits of, and pieces of that. There is, uh, I, I would recommend you to look up the work by Chris Jochem. Uh, I'm gonna write the name to the chat. Uh, Chris Jochem used to be at the University of Southampton, I think you know, at Ordnance Survey. He was doing some some research on this, and he has a library called Food, which is doing similar stuff in slum, slightly slightly different take uh, uh, to get morphology on 100 meter grid usually. And he also wrote a library which can do the morphological tessellation in R. And it's called him Motor M O T E R. Uh, but uh, most of the functionality. Uh, of, of, of Mumbai is not ported to to R as far as I know. If you know someone who's doing these things in R, I'd be happy to, to get in touch with them. Yes, thank you for the for the link. Anything to add, James? <coughs> uh, yeah, um, just if if you're using. Um, as we're trying to push more and more for open source um, software and science and reproducibility and the validity of open source software as an actual research artifact, if um, if any of the um, the stuff that uh, Martin and I, um, basically Martin presented today, is useful for you and you use it in a paper for anything, please cite the, the work. Um, if there's not an open source software paper that... Um, that is available, um, for example, from the Journal of Open Source Software. Many GitHub repositories are also um, included with um, a DOI, as a note of DOI, so you can cite a specific um, package or even a specific version of a package. Um, because a lot of us as um, scientists are more and more developing our own code, so everybody can use it. And in order to get out of the paradigm of only journal articles are considered research artifacts that you're gonna get credit for, for work, um, we're really trying to to make it known that yeah we we do appreciate um, citations even if it's not a typical journal article or something yeah, yeah that's it I think that's a great great end to the tutorial so thank you all for being here and feel free to get in touch with us via GitHub Twitter or any other way thank you.